Hi, my name's Eric Weaver. Um, my background is uh, actually comes from a think tank. I worked for USC's uh, ETC for many years, five different years, uh, focusing on next generation technologies for the studio executives. So what we're here to talk about today is, is basically object storage and just give you a brief overview of what it is and where it's going right now and then give a use case of how it's being used. Um, my current title is I run media entertainment for Western Digital. In case you don't know, Western Digital is actually now the largest storage company in the world. Com brands like SanDisk and um, GTEC and others. So we're a bit big, so we've been focused on quite a bit of things. I, I kind of wanted to start with a little bit of an upstream picture of what's coming at you. How many people are basically um, archiving Sony, Red, or Ari Alexa in the audience? How many people are using, are kind of grabbing some of that? There's several people here. But this is kind of what's coming at you right now. Uh, the new Ari Alexa can actually do about 2.6 terabytes an hour. Um, and if you're doing multiple cameras or other things, this stuff couldn't add up very quickly. Um, when you look at some of the numbers here, IDC says that basically in 2016 there was 97 uh, exabytes of data stored on object. And by 2020, it should be 330 exabytes, or 84% of the world's data will be stored on object storage. So what is object storage and, and why is it important? Why did this technology come around? So when you look at like the clouds, for example, they're all object storage. Um, so where it came about is basically, oops, um, where it came about is basically a, a failure of RAID technologies. So in RAID technologies, um, you basically have multiple failures between bit rots, uh, management of the data, um, and what you run into also is basically the RAID wall. Um, at six terabytes, it, once that drive fails, uh, it takes a while to rebuild. And as a matter of fact, as you get past six terabytes, it's almost impossible to rebuild the drives. How many people have attempted to rebuild a six terabyte or anything in the higher level drive in your environment? Several people here. So you can get into as much as a month long cycle to rebuild some of these drives. And at that point, um, it can fail in rebuild. Um, and what's coming around the corner right now, we've been kind of moving up from two terabytes a year uh, per drive. But what's right around the corner is actually 40 terabytes by 2025. So this is what the drives are gonna be coming out with when the MAMR technology. Um, it's absolutely impossible to rebuild that drive within RAID technology. So you're pretty much forced to look at or go towards something like object storage. So what are some of the fundamental differences for object storage? So I'll just really quickly talk about Reed Solomon or math. This really comes down to math and the way math works. So what it does is it takes your file and it breaks it up into um, shards. And those shards are then distributed amongst your different drives. These different drives could be in, in a single location or on multiple geolocation and other things. But it separates it all out so that failures can occur and they're not really a big deal. So on a lot of the new generations of object storage and the stuff that we roll out, Basically, we don't even replace drives anymore until like a quarterly basis. We'll come in and say, oh, this one's failed, that one's failed, but it doesn't matter. It just simply kind of goes around uh, the problem and the failed drive and continues to move it to other places. Uh, underlying that, one of the primary things that's important, important to actually to this community, a lot of my research in the past is around metadata, but it's about the metadata that makes the difference. So that when you have an immutable object, now you can place or identify uh, metadata that's critical uh, to those assets. On a, and I won't go into too many of the details here. Um, some of the big differences you're gonna notice on an object storage is the data durability, for example. Something in the scope of uh, 18 nines, uh, this is something you can scale up or scale down, but that compared to something like a traditional RAID technology that might be like six nines of reliability and is actually really rather likely to fail on you. Um, it's actually faster and growing larger than you think. A single rack can hold almost seven petabytes of data nowadays. And I actually threw a couple of these slides in, so if anybody was looking at slides later, you can kind of just read through these things, because I don't really want to do any kind of marketing, over, overly marketing pitch. <laughs> um, 
The last thing that's really important to notice is how much more cost effective, because when you're looking at building these new modern archives, you're looking at growing into petabytes and multi-petabytes of storage. Um, and what you're gonna see right now is when you're looking at an object storage system, you're, you're talking now about rates that are in the 20 cents a gig or less, which are a radical difference to some of the rate technologies and the cost you have around those. So one last thing I just want to finish before I hand off to the use case is um, I heard a lot of stuff talk today about um, identification and understanding um, uh, IDing mechanisms. One of the really neat systems that are coming out that, that aligns with this very closely is C4. C4 is basically like a, um, uh, kind of like a SHA, it's a SHA-512 technically, but it's specifically built for the industry that people can basically identify things without communication. So instead of using a central database, you're using a hash algorithm. Um, and now once that's uh, put into, it's like in systems like um, Technicolor and Photochem onset carts, PIC systems, um, and a lot of other things. Now you're all getting the same ID or it works as a Rosetta Stone. Um, but I think that uh, this is a good piece of information if you are not studying some of this stuff that you should uh, definitely take a look into. So with that, I'd actually like to go to the case study, uh, Alain Dupré from the Montreux Jazz Festival and EPFL. Thank you, thank you, Eric. I'm very pleased to be able uh, to say a few words about the Montreux Jazz Festival archives. Um, you probably know the Montreux Jazz Festival. Uh, it was created in 1967 by a guy who had a special vision, Claude Knops. Uh, he had the idea uh, of creating a festival and recording it in video from the first days. Actually, the, the origin of this festival was that the situation, the touristic situation in Montreux, Montreux was a town where many, many people used to come from England with the whole family during the whole summer, and it was at the beginning of last century. They built a lot of hotels uh, near the lake, then on top of the mountains, and um, of course it was working well, but afterwards uh, there were the, the wars. And in the 50s, uh, the situation was becoming critical. And it's the tourism office who invited, uh, hired Claude Knobs, actually. And his mission was to put again Montreux on the map of the world. And he said, OK, I will create a festival. And I will record it from the first day in video, uh, which was really unusual at that time. And especially at the, in the United States, it was very difficult because of syndicate uh, and rules, uh, you probably know better than me. But in Switzerland, we didn't have that. So the goal was to create the festival, record it, and broadcast the content in, uh, in the world on the television channels to, to have it known. And actually, 50 years later, uh, we have, the, as Quincy uh, Jones said, the most important testimonial to the history of music, especially in jazz, blues, and, and rock. And we have uh, a digitization project, which started in 2007. A uh, foundation was created as well to take care about the whole content and preserve the collection for years. And uh, the whole collection was uh, inscribed at UNESCO in the Memories of the World. It's the first audiovisual library that was inscribed in this uh, category. Um, Claude Knobs had a vision, as I said, but he had other, uh, other ways uh, of promoting the festival. He was a guy who used to welcome the artists in a really beautiful way, a really warm way. So he had a chalet. Uh, he acquired actually a chalet on top of the mountains near Montreux. You can see here the view uh, that we have on, on the lake. And that's the place where he used to welcome all the artists. He was a cooker, uh, basically, so he could do really nice uh, cooking for the artists. They were coming here on holidays. Uh, they were uh, organizing jam sessions with other musicians. And this, this, uh, this fact made Montreux well known as well in the world of the musicians, especially in, in the jazz world. 
And to give an anecdote or uh, some uh, stories, the festival was helped a little bit by different events that occurred during its, um, its uh, life. The first uh, one was in 1969, uh, when suddenly during the festival there is a hole in the program. Claude Knops doesn't want, doesn't know what, what to do. Uh, he said he takes the the artist who was present before and the, the, the other one after, and he asks them, please go on stage and improvise something, do something together. And uh, it was Eddie Harris and Liz McCann, and they did a, an incredible concert. Uh, the head of the Atlantic Record uh, label was in the room and he said, okay, this I want to record. And Claude Nob said, okay, but with Montreux Jazz, uh, live at Montreux Jazz Festival and uh, on the cover. And then it became uh, a big uh, tune during months in the clubs in the, in the US, making the festival known uh, in this world. Then you probably all know Deep Purple, Smoke on the Water. It's another story in 1971. Uh, there is a concert in, uh, by Frank Zappa in 71 in the, in the venue in Montreux. And suddenly one guy sent a rocket uh, to, the, to the ceiling. And uh, the ceiling is made of bamboo. And uh, it starts burning. And actually, at the beginning, people think that it's a kind of effect. And everybody is looking at that without re really reacting. And the, the, the casino, the venue, will burn down totally. Uh, nobody will be hurt because everybody will be able to, to go out on the grass along the lake. Deep Purple was there. They were recording uh, their album uh, in the studio, which is next to the festival. And they saw uh, these uh, this things happening. And they, they wrote a song, Smoke on the Water. And they came a few days after to Claude with a cassette and uh, they offered him the song, Claude, it's for you. And Claude listened to the thing and he said, it, that's not for me, that's for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and it became effectively one of the best song of the, of the band. So different uh, events all along the life of the, of the festival, which made it uh, quite famous. Another point was the technology. Claude Knops was fond of technology. So he was always trying to record the festival, of course, with the usual equipment, but in addition, with the newest uh, technologies coming out. And in particular, he tried HD video recordings in 1991 in a prototype together with Sony. And so it means that 15 years before uh, the public had access, at least in Europe, had access to, to HD, uh, this archive is recorded in, in high definition. And uh, the archive is made actually of several versions. We have most probably two or three formats of tapes uh, in parallel for every concert, which is good because in the end we can have, one, one format may have uh, decreased in quality very, very fast, but the other one is, is still here. So, a few numbers about these uh, archives. So, it's 14,000 tapes, 18 different audio and video formats, and it covers the 50 years, now 52. Uh, within three weeks, we'll have the, the 52nd edition. Um, uh, 5,000 hours of concerts, but as you see here, 11,000 hours of recordings in video. So it means more than twice the number of hours of concert because he recorded several times the same, uh, the same concerts. Audio, uh, we have 6,000 hours, including the multi-tracks. So uh, this is something uh, particular as well to have recorded every single instrument alone, at least from, from 1974, when we had the first two-inch multi-track formats. We had pictures as well uh, from Basically, one photographer, we took care about one uh, collection, 100,000 pictures that we digitized in our, in our institution. Those are the, the, the pictures here. Uh, and here you can see the location where the archive is stored. For, for, for another anecdote, actually, the, the production, the audiovisual production of the festival was uh, covered by the television in Switzerland. But suddenly, in 1988, uh, Claude Nobs, uh, observed that uh, the television is 
using again some old tapes uh, to record other things. And typically, uh, the event occurred when he comes to Geneva at the television asking for the concert of uh, Aretha Franklin in 1971. And they, they tell uh, him, no, we, we don't have it. And he said, okay, you're joking. I really know that we, we, we recorded it together. I will show you where it is. And they, they go and they find the tape. Uh, but the tape uh, was, uh, there was a drawing uh, on that. And instead of Aretha Franklin, it was a football match, fourth level in valleys in the mountains. So it was a bit too bad. But in the end, this event was uh, a good thing because uh, he decided to acquire the whole collection of supports. He bought all the supports and he built this uh, bunker as we say, uh, next to the chalet. And all the tapes could stay there for 30 years and the, the, they are now still in a good, good shape. So basically the, the, the archive is, is in a good, good shape. So I'm from the, the engineer school in Lausanne, EPFL, and we started, uh, we, co we came into the loop in uh, 2007. Uh, when Claude Nobs met with our president and uh, he explained in the chalet that, uh, okay, the best uh, talents of the last century in jazz, blues and rock. And Patrick Ebischer, the president, told him oh, that's an incredible patrimony, but do you have a copy of that? Ah, oh, no, no, it's expensive, I cannot do, do that, so can you help? Well, yes, the idea that we had at EPFL was to take care about the uh, digitization. So first, uh, first point, digitize and preserve the content. But the interest uh, which was behind is to use the, the content afterwards, which is digitized, to give it to the researchers in acoustics, signal processing, musicology, neuroscience, even design, architecture, a lot of different domains where this incredible database, real world database, could be a real uh, reference for the researchers. So that's really the scheme of our project. We digitized everything, we are nearly to the end, and we started immediately to innovate and valorize, add value, I should say, to, to the content through innovation projects. Uh, and this was a, a parallel process which allowed us as well to find the money to, to go on and uh, get to the end of the digitization steps. So we, we are a team, in 2016 we were 12 people and up to now we are nearly, now it's 150 on the slide, but it's probably 200 researchers who did participate to that project up, uh, up to now. Uh, the foundation that was created has this uh, mission to make accessible the Montreux Jazz Festival audiovisual collection to the largest number by any technologi technological mean, but always in compliance with copyrights and for education and research above all. Uh, so, it, in, in one glance here, uh, you see the different tasks that we had to cover. Of course, as usual, inventory, creation of a database for the, the metadata, Digitization, we need not digitize by ourselves, but of course we, we could delegate that to, to the professionals. Quality control, documentation, storage, preservation for the long term, we are still on the way to find the proper funding for that. And adding value, innovation and education is uh, the, the main interest. I have to say a few words about the rights, because in music, you know, it's always the, the, the challenge. Uh, at the festival in Montreux, the artists sign a contract with the festival and here they include uh, promotion rights. They say, okay, you can use the, the recording for uh, promotion of the festival, maybe during six months on television, in uh, a special environment, in the Montreux Jazz Café. Uh, but there is no right for really a public display. So, uh, since uh, Claude Nobs had an idea in the, in the 90s to build the Montreux Jazz Café, uh, a place where you can go and eat, have a, have a drink, and look at the concert. 
And since that time, he asked to the artist to give their okay for three selections, typically per concert, to be shown in, in that uh, structure. So that's a place, uh, there are eight now in the world, where you can see part of the archive. At EPFL in Lausanne, we built a Montreux Jazz Café in, in the way of being able to show the result of the digitization. But since we are on a campus, we benefit in Switzerland of an exception on author's rights for education and research. So having a caf Montreux Jazz Café on the campus allows us to show uh, a lot, a big part of the archive, uh, around 80%. Unfortunately, that's the, the only w w uh, place in the world for now where we can see that. But at least it's already a way to, to make that public. We'll see in the future how, we, how it goes. Uh, this means that we need to have uh, at EPFL, where we digitize everything, where we store now the data, we need to have a proper uh, secure system for the whole archive, so it is not on the usual network of the, of the school, it's on a private network. Metadata on the other side is available uh, online. So a few uh, slides about the tools that we did develop, you see here the the, the front end of an internal tool for, for searching the, the database, we had to develop a quality control uh, scheme, of course, with a procedure. Uh, first, to make sure that there is no issue in the digitization process, but as well to try and uh, list the possible uh, issues or defects that we see originally on the tape. Storage at the beginning was uh, started on two sets of LTO tapes. We started with LTO4 in 2011. We are now uh, to LTO6, moving to, to 7 soon. And we had an opportunity, and that's where I'm, I'm joining the, uh, the talk of Eric. We had a contact with AmpliData, a young company in Belgium, uh, which was coming out with a new system uh, based on object storage. And uh, we could use this content, uh, this, uh, this uh, storage, to store one petabyte. So one petabyte was not sufficient at the beginning to store all the Montreux Jazz archive because we decided to digitize everything in a non-compressed uh, format, even HD. Uh, but we could store the second level of the archive, which is a broadcast level, MXF uh, OP1A. Uh, and it was for us really uh, an incredible comfortable situation because we could do all the quality control indexing of the, of the content uh, with live access uh, online for the people who, was wor who were working with that. Uh, in 2015, uh, we moved to uh, the active archive. So there, uh, the object storage system is uh, split in three parts and uh, we have two different racks of 4.7 petabytes each uh, on the PFL campus and we have a third one which is in Montreux. Uh, they are linked of course by uh, high bitrate uh, optical fiber and uh, we can organize, here you see the, uh, the interface that we have developed uh, to efficiently uh, transfer the files uh, when we are working with that. And um, the, 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 the very interesting point with this system, uh, from 2014, we could organize what we call the live archiving of the new editions of the festival. So we went on place in a data center in Montreux. There are three venues for the three concert halls in Montreux. So we could record on workstations. Uh, we had the, the, the video stream coming directly on, onto our, our workstations. We could record uh, the files immediately and archive every, every data immediately after the concert, which means that we can run some transcoding uh, operations during the night after the concert. The morning after, we have students cutting the songs, identifying the events, the titles, and clean, cleaning up the, the content. In the afternoon, we have the right uh, coordinator in the festival telling us what we can show. And in the end, as you see on the right uh, of this uh, slide, we could show 
the concert, not only the one from the past archive, but together with the concert of the day before, in a free access, uh, accessible place on, on site at the festival. This was a very nice uh, experience. People were coming, they could not find tickets, and the day after they, were, they could already uh, discover the concert. So this uh, is a point which is very interesting for us because it allows us to exploit the data immediately and in a way that the public can, can show the things. Because during the festival, we, that's one of the opportunity, again, because of the promotion rights, where we can uh, show the, the archive to the public. So this was really a nice uh, opportunity. You see here we have, of course, I won't go into the details, but ingestion process. Here you see a place where uh, we could show the, the archive on, on tablets, iPads. And in terms of innovation, that's uh, the transition I can do with this slide. To show you different examples of the innovation work we've done, you see the cube which is on the ceiling here. It's a projector for sound. So the people you see here who are looking at the concert on the iPad, they have the sound coming from above. And they don't have to wear uh, headphones or anything. Three meters away, you have a second cube like this, and you have another team who can discover another concert. So, and, and there are even four of them in the room. So it's a device that was developed by our acoustic team in relation with the archive and allowing a promotion of the work that was done in this lab, enhancing as well the experience of discovering the, the archive. Another project that I can show here is especially, again, related to the casino that burned in 71. This casino had a very nice acoustics. So we had acousticians on the campus why not uh, build uh, a virtual model of the acoustic of this old casino from the video, from uh, the pictures, looking at the different materials, uh, modeling the materials on the walls, the geometrical uh, situation. And in the end, we could invite a few persons in a room, again, in the festival area, and we could project a video and this video was bringing the people flying over the public of the, uh, of the venue and together with sound, uh, the sound was following uh, the way of the camera because we had put some 3D sound system, ambisonics or wave field synthesis and the experience was ta taking you uh, flying over the public and at the beginning you were on the rear of the venue you could hear a lot of reverb. In the end, you, you go on stage and you pass just near to the drummer and there you have the drums at 20 centimeters of your ear. Very immersive uh, way of reproducing a, or re-experiencing a, a concert. I told you about the multitracks. We have the content of the, the recordings of every instrument alone. So why not preparing an interface where you can uh, group the different instruments by in objects like the, the, the round objects you see on this uh, interface. And then you can remix the concert. You can tune the volume. You can even, if you have a 3D structure for sounds around you, move them around and rebuild the stage uh, of the concert. Uh, what you can do as well is rebuild the stage but then you remove an instrument and you rebuild a mix with the other instruments and you invite an artist to play live the missing instruments in front, uh, yeah, within background, the, the, the video recording. So this was done two or three times at the Swiss Culture Center in Paris. Here it's Anna Aaron that you see uh, singing over uh, the concert of Peggy Abe. Of course, we did uh, restoration, a little bit of restoration for particular types of defects. Here you see David Sanborn. Uh, you, you know probably all of you those lines generated in the cameras by the, the, the high level of the acoustic. So it was impacting nearly 15 years of the festival. So how to remove those lines we developed with, uh, with a multimedia signal processing group. Uh, an algorithm uh, which is in the end semi-automatic in order that you can tune the correction correctly 
and we can generate a second level of the archive. Second, we, of course, we don't touch the reference archive, but we can generate a new one without uh, those defects. Uh, there is a challenge, you know, now we are moving to 4K, 8K, and we want to show together with that the old SD content, which is really precious with those jazz uh, artists from the 70s. It's always annoying when you switch back from uh, even from HD to SD. So uh, we are on the way to design an algorithm using, using machine learning and really learning uh, the features of the HD image, uh, not only improving the resolution, uh, but really doing a new model of HD images to try and improve and create HD content from the, uh, or high quality content, I should say, from the, the old videos. Uh, metadata, of course, uh, and we were talking yesterday evening about meta metadata. Uh, here we generate thumbnails uh, based on aesthetical criteria for every song, scanning the videos, and we can generate either a, a, a thumbnail or a mosaic of different images. Uh, that's something, we have 46,000 songs in the Montreux Jazz Archive, so it's a lot if we would have to do that manually, the algorithm can, uh, will be able to, to do that automatically. And of course then you would have to uh, add some information about which image you had taken for that. So it's, uh, it starts with the, the metadata bringing a lot of new data. Uh, here I'm back to the, the artist information. What you see here uh, is a representation of all the artists who came to Montreux. And every artist is uh, displayed by one point. If two artists play together, there is a line between the two of them. So the, on the right, you would have in the periphery all the bands who came but never mixed with other artists playing alone. And at the center, you have this kind of galaxy with all the stars, actually. Uh, in orange, you would see George Duke. Uh, George Duke produced 10 years of the festival, uh, so he played with uh, many, many artists. Uh, you have Santana in, uh, in uh, violet. I don't know how we say it in, in English. And this type of uh, data visualization starts to be uh, a new way of entering into the database. We have tablets with simply uh, every concert by year, then you go into one year, you can see the different concerts, you go in one concert, you can see the, the songs. But here, typically for the younger generation who don't know uh, those artists from the 60s or 70s, they know probably uh, the, the musicians they like from the last five years. So they can, oh, uh, this guy, uh, I'm interested to know who he would play, he had played with, and you can simply type the name and it would zoom, it would zoom into this image and you would see the different links of this artist with others. And there you would probably find that this guy was uh, in collaboration with a guitarist who came 10 years before and who uh, this artist played with 10 years before and you can in this way enter the, the database. So the future for this, uh, there are so many things in metadata, detecting the solo. Uh, that's a dream that we would like to do. It's a still a challenge, uh, identifying from the audio signal what is the instrument playing. Uh, we have facilities because, because we have the multitracks, so we could model things from the multitracks and then try to recognize on the stereo uh, uh, version, but it's still uh, not easy. Here, uh, to show you the type of platforms we developed in architecture, this was the first uh, version of the Montreux Jazz Heritage Lab, as it was called, uh, for two people to be really immersed very close to the, to the screen and with uh, special sounds. What you see on the left is a door that you can close. Uh, it was designed in 2012. The next, you see here the interface on the inside. 
where we would have, uh, we had used recommendations. We had a team in the signal processing lab able to identify the similarities between songs from the audio signals, so we used these competences to uh, have a recommendation uh, system. The new version, which is now installed in the Montreux Jazz Cafe I was mentioning before in Lausanne, is a big screen and on the sides you have mirrors. And since the screen is not flat, you have replication of the image and you feel like being in a wider environment. Of course, the acoustic is uh, enlarged as well using ambit sonics. We had modeled actually the, the acoustics of every one of the venues and you can switch for the same concert, you can switch and uh, listen to it in another uh, venue. That's the, another image. The next version of that is a car. So we have, uh, we have uh, removed the glass and replaced by a screen. So you see it here entering into the, the chalet in Co. So this, is a, this was a prototype last year. It will be presented to the public of the festival this year for, for everybody in the main uh, venue of the festival. We have a lot of data now uh, to capture with the new system. Uh, you see Charles Bradley here. We did a test in 360 recording two years ago. Uh, we will uh, do it again this year with several cameras and we will even use light field cameras to try and be able to model the volume and then move uh, inside the venue uh, together, always together with the 3D sound system. So we will, as an experience, try to, yeah, to propose a new experience to the, uh, the insiders of the festival for that. And uh, regarding the storage, it's a, it's a big, uh, big challenge because uh, if you imagine several cameras in light field, if you have 15 cameras, you already end with 60 gigabit per second. So it's a lot, uh, lot of data to, to process. So I'm getting nearly to the end. As I, uh, it's, a, it's a summary of what I said. Emotion detection, artist recognition. We have plenty of new uh, things to, to start. Uh, it will be for the future. Uh, we are every year at the festival to explain this project with my, my colleagues and allowing the public to discover as well the, the concert on iPads. This is the Montreux Jazz Café uh, at EPFL. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, if whenever you come to Switzerland, to Montreux, don't forget that you can here discover the, the archive of the Montreux Jazz freely. There is no cost, of course, uh, for that. I would conclude with the, the preservation st strategy. For now, we have uh, two sets of LTO tapes, and at the center, we have the active archive system. Uh, which is split in three uh, locations. For the future, uh, we had a project with a company in, uh, in California, Twist Bioscience. You know that uh, now we, we start to be able to store data on DNA uh, with the advantage of having a, a very high density of the data and a very long-term life duration. We speak about uh, thousands of years, uh, five to six thousand of years typically. Tunable, uh, because you would encode a lot of times the same thing on the DNA, and then you're working with uh, error correction code. So you can tune all that to the level of security you, you want. For now, we did, of course, uh, a test with Deep Purple, Smoke on the Water, and uh, Tutu from Miles Davis. We did encode that onto the DNA, decode it, and it was in a conference in September last year. We could make the, the, the public listen to the decoded version coming out of the DNA. So we'll see, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, uh, if it's a, a new system coming and practically usable. That's what I mentioned, so uh, our partners, and if you have questions, don't hesitate. Thank you. I think we have time for like one quick 
one. Uh, we're going to already have an abbreviated break. Um, anything popping out? I actually am going to ask a question then along. You talked about utilizing light field photography, which if you're not familiar is something really cool and almost freaky. It's one of those use cases of physics that doesn't seem like it should be possible where you can measure a photon and its trajectory so you could theoretically look around the corner of a wall, which is just kind of nuts. And so if you have the audio in 3D, you can even... Explain. So you guys are doing that. You're, you're uh, obviously embracing 360 video, virtual reality, and I think the thing that stood out to me was that very awesome data visualization. We, we've been talking about the shape of data sets today. I, I didn't know, actually, that he had that in the presentation. <laughs> you guys are a very innovative organization. That's our role. And, and attacking that innovation from an engineering perspective and not solely a musical perspective. And I'm, I'm frankly just curious, in a nutshell, what is it about the DNA of the organization? What is it about the Montreux Jazz Fest that has become this percolator, this, this, this innovation laboratory? Yeah, that, you, this is a very good point. Actually, the Montreux Jazz Festival has always been a technology uh, leader uh, because of, as I explained, because of Claude Knobs trying the new technologies. In Montreux, it was a special place. There was the symposium, the TV symposium, happening just a few weeks before the festival every year. Now it's IBC in Amsterdam. Uh, and Claude Knobs could come and just uh, look at the new things presented in the broadcast world. Uh, they had studio as well, uh, the mountain studio next to the, to the venue. So effectively, we, we started to... Claude Knobs died, I didn't mention, but Claude Knobs died in 2013. So we were already engaged in that uh, digitization process. Uh, it's a bit our, our role now to take over uh, helping the festival to keep uh, staying in the, as a state-of-the-art uh, event. And of course, you can imagine that it's a win-win uh, team because uh, the archive is such a, an incredible thing. It's a pleasure for all the researchers to work. It's a, a motivation thing. Above that, above all, you have the Montreux Jazz Festival label that allows all the labs or people who work on to have visibility. And on the other side, of course, the archive is enriched by all this, those projects, and it's not only EPFL. We are starting now to work uh, with uh, social uh, laboratories, human sciences, to study the impact of the festival. What, it, what was, f f during those last 50 years, the impact of this festival on the population in Switzerland, but everywhere in the world? Uh, so this is, again, a matter of innovation for, the, for those uh, researchers. Uh, so, yeah, it's a continuity, I would say, and the structure is this one, digitize and innovate. It's not going without problems, as you can imagine, because uh, we might, uh, we are not an archivist uh, institution at the beginning, so we might uh, be tempted to take decisions based on adding value rather than doing the, the archivist uh, archivist work properly. This happens a few times, but then we, we correct. But the structure is, has a disadvantage that you can find some money uh, through innovation.